of the account of the Good Samaritan. Probably by far one of my favorite accounts in, in all of Scripture. And as I, we got closer and I, I knew that this was the next lesson, I felt a peace. But then again, all of a sudden I felt a little bit of a concern because I could probably talk about the Good Samaritan until about 2 o'clock this afternoon. And I probably don't need to do that. I'm sure everybody wants to eat lunch. I'm not so sure that Wendy's interested in getting up here and preaching, but it's something she's been asked to do, so I know she feels responsible to go ahead and take that responsibility seriously, so I probably need to leave her a little bit of time to be able to do that. So uh, as I began to take notes, I said, Lord, give me exactly what I need, nothing more, nothing less. It's normally what I pray, but in this situation, I felt a little more urgency about it because of the topic. Once again, this is the account of the Good Samaritan. Well, what's a Samaritan? What, what was a Samaritan to the Jews? Who were the Samaritans to the Jews? We find Scripture has the answer to exactly who the Samaritans were. Mm -hmm. In 2 Kings chapter 17, we have a description of how the Samaritans came to be who they are. I'm not going to read that whole chapter. Uh, although it's relevant for the most part, I'm going to try to pick and choose here some verses. Chapter 17, verses 20, 23 through 39, and 32 and 33. And the Lord rejected the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he cast them out of his sight. Of course, this is for their failure to, to serve him as they were supposed to. Verse 23, until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had said by his servants the prophet. So it was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, and from Tutha, and from Eba, and from Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Verse 27, and the king of Assyria sent, commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom you brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. How be it? Every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. Every nation in the cities wherein they dwelt. Verse 32, so they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord, and they served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom, whom they carried away from thence. <clears throat> so we see that the Samaritans were actually foreigners who served both the God of all creation and the gods of the areas that they were all from. The thought of their divided loyalties was very offensive to the Jews. God had said that they should accept any who would serve God, but they were also told that any service to any other God was utterly forbidden. These people also were a constant reminder to the Jews of their own national failures of the past. I mean, why was the Samaritans so hated in the first place? Because the Israelites were unfaithful to God, and by their unfaithfulness were removed, and these people were brought in. Uh, the, the, the fact that the Samaritans were who they were may have brought conviction to the Jews simply by their continuing existence. The fact that they were there always reminded them of their own failures, always reminded them of who they were, and what had happened to them. They also, the, the Samaritans also became like scapegoats. Someone whom the Jews could point their fingers at 
and say, at least we're not bad as they are. That was at least what seemed to be in their minds. <clears throat> All the while, their own behavior was just as offensive to God. The Samaritans also remain as a modern example of any group of people whom we may lightly esteem or hold in low regard today. Even among them, there are those whom God is willing to use to reveal his mercy to a lost and dying world. Now, I know that there have been several occasions in my life where, where the one that I thought was least likely to serve the Lord was the first one to do so. And there are those times when, when those who we thought would be the first ones to come in never did. We don't have the ability to look into the heart. All we see is the outside. But we cannot allow the outside of an individual to steer our direction as far as how we deal with them. We have to be sensitive to the will of God. We have to be open to receive direction from Him. And if we see two people, we can't look at them and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to witness to this one because he looks like he's, he's willing to receive it. But I'm not going to witness to that one because I don't think he will. Because there are often times when God will call us directly to the one who we think is least likely because God knows the plans that he has for them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We are called to be examples to others of the love of God working in us. How does it make us look when, when those whom we may consider incapable of finding salvation actually behave in a more godly manner than we do? Depending on your own personal point of view, a modern analogy of who the Samaritans would be today could come from many different origins. Today, the account could be about uh, the good Muslim the good atheist, the good homosexual, the good socialist, the good Democrat, the good Republican, the good drug dealer, the good <laughs> prostitute, the good alcoholic, or any member of any group whom the religious world may find offensive. God is no respecter of persons. He will use one just as well as another. It is our responsibility not to put one another down whether in or out of the church, but to lift up the worthy name of Jesus by our behavior. Not just the words that we speak, not just the things that we say, the lives that we live, the actions we take, the things we do, all need to lift up the worthy name of Christ. It's, it's nothing to say, glory to God, that's easy. But to live, glory to God. That is our responsibility. Yeah. It's easy to say, glory to God, among those who are like-minded. It's more difficult to live glory to God when we're out in this world. But we're not called to speak love, the love of God. We're called to live the love of God in everything that we say and everything that we do. It was a sad state when the Jews could see such an unacceptable person Behaving more godly than themselves. How much more offensive is how much more offensive is it to God when He has to go to such an extreme measure to get our attention when we fail to live up to His expectations for us? Sadly, we still find it easier to point our fingers at the behavior of others when we aren't even living up to God's will for our own lives. This behavior is still unacceptable to God today. <clears throat> we'll get into commentary here for just a minute. This account is not prefaced as a parable and may have actually occurred. Even still, we see lessons taught and eternal truths relayed through these events <coughs> or illustrations, whether, they're, whether it's a parable or not. In today's lesson, we'll study about the account of the Good Samaritan, which demonstrates the example of the power of God's love and mercy through action. 
The Bible expounds through many applicable passages of Scripture that God's blessings are upon those who express His love toward others without expecting anything in return. This is exactly what God's done for us. Is it any wonder that He accepts this similar behavior from those who serve Him? What, but what could God personally receive from us? How can God benefit from us as humans. There's nothing that we can do that can actually benefit God, make him bigger, make him better, make him stronger, make him wiser, make him <laughs> wealthier. There's nothing that we could do to benefit God. How could anything we do on earth benefit God in eternity? His behavior toward us is such that he expects us to deal with others in the same way that he has dealt with us. God is not increased by our goodness, nor is his power diminished by our wickedness. But by our submission to him in all things, his goodness will be seen in us. And those around us will receive the benefit. It's not about making God better. It's not about making God stronger. It's about allowing the love of God to work through us to increase his kingdom here on earth. This is his will. That is how he treated us. That's same way regardless of how they treat us. This is the example that Christ left. When, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was hung on the cross, he didn't accuse his, his uh, murderers of any wrongdoing. What did he do? He said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. We need to understand that our behavior is supposed to emulate Christ. If people come against us, we need to recognize who the enemy is. If, if Brother Rick, if you if you come against me and you start talking about me behind my back, or, or you come to me and you punch me in the nose, I need to recognize <laughs> that you're not my enemy. But the, the common enemy of our souls has overtaken you. Right. I, I know you're not going to go talk about me behind my back. I, I, I feel pretty comfortable that you're not going to punch me in the nose. I praise the Lord for those things. Praise the Lord. But, but if those things were to occur, it's still my responsibility to love you. If you were my enemy, it would be my responsibility to love you. Why? Because we have the example of Christ. That's why we're called Christians. We're supposed to be like Jesus. How did Jesus treat his enemies? He died for us. Yes, he he suffered for us. In our place, in our stead, when we deserve the punishment, he took it upon himself. That's the love that he had for us, and that's the love that he expects us to have for others. It's easy for me to love you guys, every one of you. I don't have any problem loving you. And I don't think, looking around, I don't think any of you ever done, any, done anything against me, except for my wife, maybe. I don't <laughs> Seriously. Nobody in this church has ever come against me. So it's easy for me to love you. But God has called us beyond these four walls to love those around us, mm -hmm. to love those who do come against us, to love those whose opinions are opposed to ours, to love those who may not feel the same way that we do. Because we are called to be the example the same example to others that Jesus has been to us. The same mercy that he was willing to show us when we were in the depths of sin. Because ain't nobody come to the cross for salvation who wasn't in the depths of sin. Regardless of how little or big you think your sin may have been, it would have sent you to the same hell. It would have sent all of us to the same hell if we hadn't received that forgiveness at the foot of the cross. 
by the love that God made available to us. <coughs> this is the only acceptable behavior found in children of God. John instructs us with this thought. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. First John me, 3, 17 and 18. Like I said, it's not about the words that we speak. You know, the Bible says, uh, what, what benefit is it to, when you see your brother in need? Say, oh, be warmed and filled. But you don't give anything to help supply for those needs that they have when you have it at your disposal. <clears throat> to love in deed is, is a far greater sacrifice for us than to love in word. Me speaking kind words to you doesn't cost me anything. Me speaking kind words to the lost doesn't cost me anything. But me loving them in action, that, that may actually cost me something. That may cost me a little time. That may cost me a little effort. That may cost me a little discomfort. I'm not even talking about money. I'm just talking about the other thing that, that, that the love of our fellow humans can cost us. When we love in deed and in truth and not simply by moving our lips. Indeed, as Christians, we are commanded of our Lord to perform good deeds where possible regardless of our personal experiences, impressions, or opinions. At times, this may feel challenging for those who have dealt with hurt, hurt or disappointment in life. But be encouraged because God will surely bless those who bless others and obedience to his words. Because what did God do for us? Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 through 4, <coughs> looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of, of the throne of God. For consider him, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Anybody in this building ever, ever gotten beaten because you were talking about God? Anybody ever gotten thrown in jail because you were talking about God? Anybody ever got fired from a job because you were talking about God? Well, guess what? We've not, we've not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And if we haven't, we have some room to grow. Because we read that the, the apostles counted themselves worthy that they, they were glad, they rejoiced in the fact that they were worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. They were, wor they were rejoicing that they were beaten. The Bible says, in all things, give thanks. I'm sure they weren't thankful for the beating. I'm sure they weren't thankful for the pain. But they were thankful that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Praise the Lord. They were grateful. That they were actually, that caused them to recognize we're doing the right thing. We're moving in the right direction. We must be doing something right because we were assured that this was going to happen if we served God. We were assured that these things, <coughs> these people were going to come against us when we serve God the way we're supposed to. We must be doing something right. Praise the Lord. We got beat. Amen. We got thrown in jail. Let's keep doing this exact same thing that caused this to happen in the first place because more people need to know about the love of Christ. More people need to know about his mercy on us and his will for our lives. If the God of all creation was willing to take on a fleshly body 
suffer and die for us, is it too much for him to ask that we treat others with the same love and mercy that he had for us? Paul said in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, not your extended service, not your over and above uh, anything anyone should consider doing. It's your reasonable service. It's the bare minimum that we should expect to, to be required of us. All that means is that we ask, we are to be submitted to God in all that he asks of us. All he asks for us is to treat others the same way that he treated us. We're not called to be suicide bombers. We're not all called to be martyrs for the cause of Christ. We are simply called to allow his love to be seen flowing through us by our actions each day. We are called to be used as instruments of peace in his hands. Did you have something? Okay. Yeah. Uh, when Brother A.J. Thomason was over here, and then minister called him one day and said, Brother Thomason, I'm in jail for the gospel's sake. Brother Thomas said, praise the Lord. <laughs> I, I never had any difference. I did, was refused a job one time because I wouldn't want to make that. Oh, but, wow. uh, no big deal. I mean, that probably blessed him to me. <laughs> Well, it's blessing you to witness to them. Yes, if, if we lost a job for the gospel, say, that's why I raised my hand. I was a maintenance man for a Methodist church <laughs> down in Hazelhurst, and uh, I I needed a job, and that's what opened. So I was cleaning and and uh, vacuuming, and but the uh, the youth minister, I found out, you know, he's a really nice guy, but I found out he's living in adultery. And so, you know, I'm, I'm vacuuming. It's like I'm fighting with myself. Like, Lord, he's a, you know, he's a minister. I was like, you know, what am I supposed to do? I'm the man, I'm the janitor, you know. But I felt, I felt led of the Lord to, to go and tell him. So one afternoon when I got done, I, I wanted to ask him if I could talk to him. And I talked to him and told him about adultery and all that stuff. And he accepted it nice, you know. And I went and said, well, praise the Lord, you know. Next day, the pastor called me into his, to his office and he railed me buddy like you would not believe and they and they ended up letting me go but you know i told the lord i said you know what the blood of that man is on his hand not mine right but yes i did lose a job praise the lord praise the lord for it golden truth colossians 3 17 and whatsoever you do in word or deed do all in the name of the lord jesus christ giving thanks to god and the father by him Part one, what Jesus challenged. Luke 10, 25-28. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Luke gives us the account of a particular lawyer or scribe who gives a direct challenge to the Lord. Whether this was a public or private setting, the scripture does not make clear. Nevertheless, this does not diminish the importance of the conversation. First of all, we may presume that the lawyer's question was presented with the intent to ascertain Jesus' response and hope to find a flaw in his teaching. The Lord discerned the intention of the scribe and, in, and structured the answer back to him in the form of another question. What is written in the law? How readest thou? Bible commentator Matthew Henry observes, Christ turned him over to the divine law and bade him follow the direction of that. Though he knew the thoughts and intents of his heart, he did not answer him according to his folly, but according to the wisdom and goodness of the question that he asked. Being a scribe, he knew the law well, and therefore gave a suitable answer to the Lord from it. Jesus told him that he had answered correctly and then commanded him to follow the word of God accordingly in order to obtain eternal life. By the answer of this scribe, it seems clear that he believed within himself 
that he was faithfully fulfilling these commandments in his own life. Why would you express these commandments if you didn't believe that you were doing them? Especially in, in response to this particular question. He never questioned the validity of his own behavior. He simply accepted the law as it had been passed down to him without ever considering that there may be more to it if he would simply dig just a little bit deeper. Why do we believe what we believe today? Is it simply what the church teaches so it must be right? <clears throat> or have we been faithful to dig out these truths for ourselves until God revealed his perfect will to us personally? If we simply believe because that's what we've been told, what is, what's to keep someone else from telling us something different and we gullibly accept it as truth because we trust the individual. When God has divinely shown us his, in his, his own truth as a result of our seeking him through his word in, and in prayer, we will not be so easily led astray. We will also serve him from the heart and not simply by the precepts of men. That's all any doctrine is apart from divine revelation. It's simply the precept of men. It may be true. The precepts of men may be true. But until we personally, individually have a vision from God concerning his perfect will behind those commandments, it will have absolutely no power to have any life-altering effect on us or our behavior. The Pharisees followed the law according to their own understanding. Their failures were vividly exposed by the light of Christ. It's my prayer that we would all allow the light of Christ to reveal our own failures in all things. Not for our embarrassment, but so that we can take hold of the deeper, the, the deeper aspects of his will. Draw closer to him and share his revelation of these things with others so that he can draw them to himself as well. Part two, who is my neighbor? Luke 10, 29, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? When, just when, she, when the scribe's questions seem to be sufficiently answered, he challenges the Lord a step further with another question. And who is my neighbor? Here was the catch that the lawyer was hoping to pin Jesus down with while hoping to justify himself as well. Jews prided themselves with the notion of being God's chosen, and it was not their custom to deal with outsiders. Even though the law told them if anybody decided to serve God, they were totally acceptable. Let us remember the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. John 4 and 9. Now in this situation, not only was she a Samaritan, but she was also a woman. And generally speaking, men didn't have interaction with women who weren't very closely related to them. And in addition to that, she was a Samaritan. So the Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans and certainly wouldn't accept something that they were going to put into their bodies. And for the most part, according to their understanding of the law, they would have seen this as causing them to be unclean simply by receiving water from someone who is a Samaritan. Someone drinking from the vessel of an individual who was of this group of people would have caused them to be ritually unclean. Matthew Henry states, Dr. Lightfoot quotes their own words, to the Jews that is, to this purport, where he saith, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, he accepts all Gentiles, for they are not our neighbors, but those only that are of our own nation and religion. They would not put an Israelite to death for killing a Gentile, for he was not his neighbor. They indeed say that they ought not kill a Gentile whom they were at war with, were not at war with. But if they saw a Gentile in danger of death, 
they thought themselves under no obligation to help to save his life. <coughs> Just to make things clear here, the word translated as neighbor in this particular passage of scripture literally means a friend, the other person, or somebody who's near. It doesn't necessarily mean somebody of your own nation, nor does the word carry a connotation of being, of having a family relation, whether near or far. It simply means somebody else, not you. When it says neighbor, it's basically saying, not you. If it's not you, it must be your neighbor. Part three, the example of the Good Samaritan. Luke 10, 30 through 35, and Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, and likewise a Levite. When he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Part A, the accounts particular. Jesus responded to the lawyer's second question with the account of the Good Samaritan. It is to be left up to the individual, to individual speculation as to whether the events of this account actually happened or not, but we cannot dismiss the specific real-life elements that Jesus used. For example, he included such terms as a certain man, a certain priest, a Levite, the cities of Jerusalem and Jericho, and then he incorporated, of all things, a Samaritan, which the Jews despise because of their interracial mixing with other nations and the worship of their gods. Matthew Henry suggests that because Jesus used these real-life terms and places, that it was indeed a real happening. Jesus presented this account in the form of a realistic scenario, much different than the parables he taught. This was one lesson that gave a clear understanding of his teaching points and <clears throat> And the lawyer would not be able to dismiss so easily. Once again, Matthew Henry aids us with the understanding here, with understanding here. Dr. Lightfoot tells us that many of the courses of the priests had their residence in Jericho and thence came up to Jerusalem when it was their turn to officiate there, and so back again, which occasioned the abundance of passing and repassing of the priests that way, and Levites, their attendants. And with this in mind, the realism of the parable's lesson is more solidified. Now, I was in a Bible study at, at one time where it was suggested that the man who <coughs> fell among the thieves may have been Jesus himself. Now, while this is certainly speculation, at least consider the possibility just for a moment. Who would have known the particulars better than the one, than one who was personally involved. And we know that the Son of God could have foreseen such an event. It is also clear that he could have had the power to evade this attack if it was him. But just as he was willing to suffer and die for all of us, what if? What if he saw this encounter with this lawyer and knew that this would be the only way to reach this individual and turn his heart to God. Perhaps Jesus saw the good that this lawyer would do in the future and allowed this to take place for the benefit of many by this one man's salvation. Now, don't take this as the gospel. This is simply the, the nature of man. Jesus, the Christ, his willingness to go out of his way to save souls. This is something that Jesus was known for doing. Not suffering on the side of the road at hand thieves, but he suffered 
for others. The person in this account, whether it was Jesus or anybody else, suffered for the benefit of this lawyer to show him the truth. Once again, whether the individual had any knowledge of the situation or not, they're irrelevant. But at least consider that possibility. The account's truth. Jesus was well aware that the scribe was attempting to justify his lifestyle by masking, masking it with this traditional interpretation of the law. This interpretation of the law that said your neighbor is only those who are closely related to you. This, your neighbor is only those who, who, who are Jews also. Therefore, Jesus related this account which contained the gravest of circumstances to bring about God's eternal truth to this man. The idea that man, that a man was left to die on the street is a horrible thing to start. But perhaps what was to follow was even more horrible than his physical condition. Here comes a priest and a Levite, both knowledgeable of God's law. But as they pass by and notice the injured dying man, they just continue on their way. Not only so, but they made it a point to go around him as leaving the impression that they didn't want to even get close to him. Where was their compassion? <clears throat> and it does seem reasonable to consider that these supposedly holy men were on their way to perform their duties in the temple. And we just, one of the commentators, uh, the truth of what these commentators uh, have said seems to be well verified that the Levites pass, and, the, and the priests pass back and forth between Jericho and Jerusalem on their way to the temple to, to perform their duties. This being the case, perhaps they were so concerned with their ritual cleanliness that they were unwilling to show compassion on this man who was likely a fellow Jew, even if he wasn't Jesus. It would seem that their desire to fulfill their duties as priests and Levites overruled any compassion they may or may not have felt. If they had seen to his needs and he actually died in their care, they would not have been able to perform their temple duties for as long as seven or eight days. As a further result, they would be responsible to take part in ritual cleansing according to the law. And once again, depending on the situation, this may or may not have required sacrifices at their own expense. Their positions of authority and their desire to be seen as faithful Jews overpowered their compassion on this injured man. Then came along a Samaritan who found this injured man and had compassion on him. He nursed his wounds, then transported him to an inn where he paid for his lodging and care. Now, I, I feel confident that I need to point out the fact here. The Bible says the Samaritan gave the innkeeper two pence. Two pennies. Now, the name of the coin here does very little to convey the value in modern terms of what the Samaritan did. I, I spent a little time on this, and in today's money, according to my calculations, taking into account Jesus' parable of the workers in the vineyard, who were paid a penny for a day's work, and the average salaries of laborers without a high school diploma from the first quarter of 2019, the, values of, the value of these two coins would have been approximately $240. And once again, these are, these are just my personal calculations based on the average daily pay of individuals. Uh, the workers in the vineyard were were obviously laborers, so I, I specifically looked at the, the income for laborers without a high school diploma. $240. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not pocket change to me. This is a serious investment in the life of a stranger. If this were a relative, it might be expected. If it were a friend, it would show a very close relationship. For a stranger, this type of charity is quite rare. But for an enemy, this would have been an enemy. This was a Jew who fell among thieves and was 
brought to, to, to be helped by a, a Samaritan. It, it's possible that this Samaritan had, a, had been spat on by this very Jew laying half dead on the side of the road. But regardless, he saw a human life. He saw a need. And he was willing to help this enemy. It's beyond explanation. The only analogy that can be drawn is the love of God who would send his only begotten son as a ransom for the very enemies of God and the love of Jesus who willingly paid the debt that none of us could ever afford yet. You are using um, the money as our example in our, in our day. I keep thinking about characters that we know in our day today as these people. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, it could be one of us being one of those that pass by. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many today that I come in contact with every day that's like Mexican, Mexicans are evil. Right. Black people are evil. Right. They shouldn't be here. You know, and I'm thinking about that could be somebody laying out on the street. Right. If we say, oh, that's a Mexican. He's probably illegal. We'll just leave him laying there. We're no better than that. We're no better than that. Uh, and then I think uh, even yeah. of a homosexual coming by and seeing that Mexican laying on the street. Right. And that was my point at the beginning of my and, story. And saying, you know, come on, let's get you help right. because you need help. You know, there are people in this world that are sinners. Mm -hmm. I know several people that are homosexuals, and I'm not condoning what they do whatsoever, but I've seen their love for people. Right. I know people to this day that will take in foster kids because they're worried about mankind. I know people who are not serving the Lord that they, they will give their shirt off their back for right. somebody. They will feed the needy, the homeless, without question. Right. They don't have to question. Well, where did you spend your money last week? Right. Or are you legal or illegal? And it's sad to say that sometimes in the church we kind of put up those walls that where we place judgment on people. Oh, well, they're not my brother and sister in Christ. Or, oh, they don't tithe. Or they don't do this. Or they don't do that. They've gotten themselves into their own problems. And I can just go on by the street and just ignore them because they're not anybody because they're not part of me. Right. They're not part of Christ. That and I believe it's exactly the same. I believe that God is trying to tell us we have to love people. Yes. It's his job to straighten everybody out. Right. It's okay. our job to love people and be a servant to right. one another. And it's hard. Right. Because I find myself daily going through those struggles to yeah. where I want to question. Especially, how did you get yourself in this mess in the first place? Right. You know what I mean? I'm like, Lord, I'm trying my best to get where I need to be. And these other people are doing all this stuff, and I place judgment on them. Mm. And I need to love them. Right. You know, and I think, where's the love of those in the church? We should be the, for, we should be the forefront of helping those in need, Amen. not at the back. The Samaritan went above and beyond what the average person would ever do. Amen. He demonstrated love, mercy, and gave the Amen. utmost care to this unfortunate man. In part three, concluding the matter, Luke 10, 36, and 37. I'll just try to rush through this as quick as I can. Now, which of these three think his style was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that shewed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go. And do thou likewise. I'm going to skip some commentary here and just read some notes. I'm coming on the end here. This account goes far deeper than we actually usually give it credit for. We pass over it as if it were just another parable, as it's often and it's often described as such. But this this account goes right to the heart of God. It reveals a love so intense that only God could have orchestrated it. And Jesus says to us all, go and do thou likewise. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Only those who truly have a divine revelation of God. 
and what he's done for us. Jesus' teaching of this parable revealed the corrupt nature of it that Israel had taken in conjunction with God's law. It was not to be used for their convenience, but rather to please God in living by it, something they had failed to do. Jesus was preparing his people for the breaking down of the wall, not only between God and man, but also between the Jews and Gentiles. It would seem, as, as Sister Wendy was pointing out here, it would seem that those walls which were torn down between the Jews and the Gentiles of Paul's time have been rebuilt between the sinners and the saints of today. It would be no wonder if sinners tried to build up those walls in order to separate themselves from the conviction power of God. But sadly, it appears that all too often it is those who call themselves Christians who are rebuilding the walls to block out the unsavoriness of the very lost souls whom they should be reaching out to for salvation. And the account of the Good Samaritan, he dug deeply into his own pocket to help this wounded enemy of his. But God has already paid the price for the lost of this world. He only asks us to give them what we have already received directly from God himself. We don't have to give of our own stuff. All we have to give is what God has already given us in the first place. We need not burden ourselves. The debt's already been paid in full. It remains them to the never-ending treasures of God's undying love by allowing that love to flow freely through us. God has cleared the way for the lost. Will we be found faithful if we're blocking the way to salvation by our own poor representation of God's love for them in our behavior? In conclusion, the example of the Good Samaritan is one of them for all of us to learn and live by. If our hearts have been changed by through salvation, then our desire will be to please God and not ourselves. Let us conclude with Paul's words here. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6, 9 and 10. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Is all the good that you're doing wearying you out? Are you feeling run down by the trials of waking up each day and to the same old rat race? Are your hearts failing for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth? Then it's high time to turn back to the author and finisher of our faith. We must recall the words of Jesus and then live by them. Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If this doesn't describe your life, return to Jesus for a full refreshing of the spirit of peace and joy, which can only be found in him. He holds the keys to this life and the next. Let's run to him for strength, the strength we need, and stop relying on our own strength, which will not take us through the least of the trials of this life. I praise the Lord for this account. I praise the Lord for God's willingness to show us his love for us in many and varied ways, not only through the word of God, but through our own lives. And I thank, thank the Lord for this opportunity to be here this morning. And I uh, uh, pray that all is well with you. I'll turn it over to somebody.